I intend to share undisclosed facts that are stranger and scarier than most people can comprehend, and it is going to shake the public to the bone. And yes, this involves a cover-up of the highest order by national space agencies, including NASA. The asteroid is 100% certain to strike Earth, according to one space expert who says this is a matter of life and death. You'd probably have millions of casualties. Is a planet-killing asteroid a possibility? NASA has determined that the threat is real. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And many men died of the waters. Chief technology experts and working scientists agree with me. But what's more concerning is that this was prophesied in the Bible for the end times. Welcome to Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. It's a special program as we kick off a series of four programs about a brand new book from the best-selling author, CEO of Skywatch TV, Dr. Thomas Horn. The book, The Wormwood Prophecy, NASA, Donald Trump, and a Cosmic Cover-Up of End Time Proportions. Joining me on the panel to discuss this over the next several weeks, my best friend, co-author of our new book, Veneration, Sharon K. Gilbert. Hi, sweetie. And the author of the book, the aforementioned Dr. Thomas Horn. Tom, welcome back. Great to be here. The Wormwood Prophecy, um, what is the connection? And I know that there's some things that you can't reveal yet on this program, but what is the connection between Wormwood, which is the prophesied star that falls from heaven or mountain burnt that falls mm -hmm. from in Revelation, and chaos? Yeah, well, let's get to that in a moment. Okay, um, all right. But first... Uh, let me start by saying that for a while, Charisma has wanted to publish a book by me. Because mm -hmm. people are going to wonder why in the world with yeah. us owning Defender Publishing. That's right. That's why I didn't mention CEO right. of Defender Publishing. Because, mm -hmm. you know, right. okay, yes, why is this right. not a Defender book? Why is this a Charisma book? Yeah. And uh, anyway, long story short, um, Steve Strang, that Steve owns, uh, you know, uh, Charisma and is the CEO of several other operations, the publishing house, the magazine, all that. We were on the phone. And But we were talking about, you know, what is my next project? And I said, I am feverishly working on a book that right now I'm only calling Wormwood. I started sharing some things with him. And then he emailed me like, I don't know, three, four hours later. And he said, odd. He said, I searched through Google. I searched through Amazon. I cannot find a single book on the Wormwood prophecy that has been written from a conservative Christian point of view. Now, of course, there could have been something in antiquity. We know that the early church fathers, you know, had their ideas about Wormwood, and we're going to get into some of those as these weeks transpire. Uh, but that was the same thing. I went to just Amazon and looked up Wormwood. The only thing I could find over there was a New Age book where a guy was tying it to Nibiru or Nibiru, however, oh, yeah. whatever you call yeah. it, and, and the Mayan prophecies and just a whole bunch of gobbledygook. Mm -hmm. uh, but I couldn't find anything. So that was a point of interest to me. And as we're doing these programs, this is really coming out of Revelation 8, 10 through 11 that says, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter." So we're going to kind of walk around, you know, what is that text actually talking about, what the early church fathers believe, what people like Dr. Michael Heiser believes, what I personally uh, believe. Uh, but let me say this all started with something for me that is more metaphysical. I don't think I have ever talked about this on Skywatch TV. 
I've only spoke of it privately with my family on a couple of occasions. And then one time I hinted at it on one of Sid Roth's It's Supernatural. And it's, it's an event that happened to me many years ago now when I was just a young Christian and was just so passionate. I mean, just every day literally begging God to let me be in the ministry, right? Just feeling that, you know, when you're called into the ministry before you even know what's going to happen or what it means, but the zeal of the Lord hath eaten me up. You know, you just have that passion in your heart. And so I was at that time, you know, just praying every single day. Uh, And I came home one night and went to bed. The next thing I know, and this was very vivid. This was not like, you know, I had a dream. This was something different. So far as I knew, this was actually happening. I didn't know how I got there. I didn't really even quite know what was going on. But I was standing in something very brilliant. In my mind, I'm thinking this is like a throne, right? Like the, the, like the prophets may have described the throne of God, mm-hmm. right? Just absolutely brilliant. Somehow I also knew in my mind that I was standing before God. And I was saying something. And as I listened to myself, right, what I was saying was, please, don't let me forget. Don't let me forget. And somehow I knew that he had told me I was going to forget whatever it was he had told me. It just didn't make any sense at all, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm begging, please don't let me forget. And all of a sudden, I start falling. Like, like I've jumped out of an airplane without a parachute, right? And my back is, is beneath me. And I'm literally falling. And I can see all of this and the sky, everything moving away from me very rapidly, right? And I'm, I'm falling, falling, falling. All of a sudden, I see the roof of my house go, and it went right around me. And I fell on the bed, right? I felt myself physically hit the bed. And immediately, now I'm awake. And immediately, I sat up in bed and I breathed in real deeply. (gasps) Like that. Mm -hmm. And then I hear my wife, and she's bawling her head off. Now Mm. I'm awake now, right? And I look over at my young wife, Nita, and she is, her, her face is just, her hands in her face, and she is bawling. And I'm like, what's going on? What's, what's the matter? What's happening? And it really took her a few minutes to collect herself, right? And then she explained to me that she had woke up in the middle of the night and I was dead. Now, this wasn't just she poked me and I didn't move. This was her spending probably 10 full minutes trying to resuscitate me. She doesn't know how to do it. She's beating on my chest. I have no pulse. I'm cold, actually, to the mm-hmm. touch. Uh, I'm not breathing. She puts her ear down to my mouth. She can't hear me breathing. I'm just not there, right? This is what she was doing while I was somewhere else. Uh, And then when I woke up, it took her a moment for her to collect herself. Now, fast forward so I don't go into every detail. But the next day, I go and see my pastor. And I tell him all about it because I'm a young Christian. I don't even have no idea what this means, right? And his response, well, let's just say that his response was the definition of the New Testament, not to cast your pearls before swine, not saying that my pastor is a pig, (laughs) but that he totally did not get the idea of something supernatural, right? He just thought I ate too much chili or something before I went to bed. So as a young Christian, I immediately then put up this wall where I am just not going to share this with anybody else because whatever it was for me was as it was more real than the than this matrix that we live in here, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I didn't know how you know anybody would understand it. And really, what I needed was an answer. It just did not make any sense to me at all. Why would God right tell you something? And then say, but you're not going to remember. What is the point in that, right? Mm -hmm. I just didn't get it. And every day I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm praying. And I want to show you. um, So for the very first time in my life as a young Christian, I was reading through the Bible. I'd never read it. Well, I'd hardly read any of it, right? And uh, so I'm reading through the Bible. About This is maybe two to three weeks later. I'm still praying about this every day. What what did that all mean? And I came upon this scripture. So this is Job 33, starting at verse 14, and it says this, For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceives it not. Verse 15, In a dream 
in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, and slumberings upon the bed, then he opens the ears of men, and sealeth their instructions, that he may withdraw man from his purpose, and hide pride from man. Hmm. And I'm telling you, that, you know, the difference between Logos and Rhema. When I read that that day, and I knew nothing about theology or scripture, I knew nothing. Uh, when I read that, the, my mind was so open so quickly, and I instantly got it, that God had sealed within me during the night in deep sleep and slumbering upon the bed instructions that were going to serve some kind of a purpose. But why would he not let me remember that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. And I immediately got that, even as a, just a baby Christian, right? That if I had known where someday I would be, first of all, I, wouldn't, I would not have taken the course that I needed to take, right? Right. For all the, the hard times, the struggles, for everything that hones us, right, as believers. The stuff we don't really want to go through, but later on in life you look back and you realize you really needed to go through those, those trying times because it defines your character. It makes you who you are. If I had known that someday we'd be doing television, speaking at people's conferences, publishing books, doing all this stuff, what would I have done? I would have aimed at it. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I would have set my focus on it, and I, I would have been doing everything to make that happen, right? But God wouldn't let me remember. Why? Because he wants to withdraw man from his purpose. Mm-hmm. The second thing, that he might hide pride from man, because as a very young Christian, had I seen myself, the stuff I do today, and I don't think about it. It doesn't affect my pride. I don't think of you know, myself as anything. But back then, I might have been tempted. Sure, And then sure. that could have ruined everything that, that, that God wanted to happen. Okay, I, I said all that to say this. There have been a few times in my life, and my son Joe, you know, who's standing off camera over here, could verify this, uh, in which something odd happens. And it's always in the middle of the night. In fact, what's strange, maybe you could explain what this means, it's almost always around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will be, again, in the most vivid kind of dream. These are, these are more like, I mean, like a, a full-on uh, theatrical uh, Hollywood-level film in terms of the graphics and the three-dimensionality, the colors and stuff that we're not supposed to have in dreams, right? This has happened a few times in my life. Joe will tell you that when we were getting ready to move here, right? to do everything we're doing here today from Oregon, and I resigned from the Assemblies of God. Something happened. I woke up in the middle of the night. I jumped up. I wrote down all these notes. And the same morning, I sent an email to the state superintendent for the Oregon District Assemblies of God, giving him a list, a whole detailed list of a whole list of things that were going to happen. Now, recently, Joe found that old letter that I sent to him and read it, and he came to me just ashen face. He said, oh my gosh, Dad. He said, you absolutely nailed every one of these things that happened within 24 months, including the death of a, of a young man. Uh, just very mm. vivid descriptive details. Now, uh, uh, another example that most of the world is more familiar with is in 2010. And it, the weirdest thing, of course, I was studying Petrus Romanus and all that at the time. Chris Putnam and I were working on a book, right? Mm-hmm. But in the middle of the night, I have this, this vivid vision. And actually what I saw were very dark clouds rising up over the Vatican, right? Now, you could say, well, it's because you're studying all this stuff. But I woke up and immediately took a paper and I wrote down, Pope Benedict is going to resign in April of 2012. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, and people can go get the YouTubes and watch this, I'm on Sid Roth's show, I'm on Jim Baker's show, I'm on Prophecy Watchers, and and we didn't yet have the studio. And I'm saying, I believe that uh, Pope Benedict XVI is going to resign. Not only that, I believe he's going to do it in April of 2012. I'm on tape in 2010 and 11 mm-hmm. saying mm-hmm. this, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I was getting all this feedback from especially Catholics. You don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. Popes don't resign, right? Yeah. They die in office. Mm-hmm. And that had been true for something like 500 and some years, right? Right, right. Uh, and uh, so 
here's the thing. When 2012 came and nothing happened, for a while I was really confused because I was certain that this was going to happen exactly when I, well, I went out on a limb, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, but then 2013, what happens? Um, It hits the news. Pope, uh, and I remember because it was February 28th, which is my birthday. That's why I've never forgot it. February 28th, 2013, the Vatican's big announcement. Pope Benedict XVI has stepped down, right? He has resigned. Uh, and uh, But the same day, the El Observatorio Romano, which is the Vatican's news mm-hmm. media outlet, they gave an interview with the New York Times, and in that interview they admitted Pope Benedict actually secretly, officially resigned to the Roman Curia, did it privately, right? And they gave the date. He did that when he returned on a trip in April 2012. Right. And I'm telling you what, my phone lit up, including uh, reporters from Rome, everybody wanting to know who our insider was on that event. But the point was, and I cannot choose, and I don't consider myself a prophet, uh, or any of those kind of things. I just don't. I don't. I can't explain what this is. I really can't. But it is supernatural. And it has not failed me yet, but it don't happen when I want it to. That's right. I can pray and say, give me a revelation, and it, that just does not work. And I can't really even explain why. Why was it so important, this thing with the Pope? I don't know. Uh, some, sur- some larger cause, right? Now, why am I saying all this about, you know, when we're doing programs on Wormwood? It was because early this year, this happened again. Oh. And this was the worst, most terrifying uh, experience in terms of a dream, the most vivid in terms of a dream. Uh, and now I can't share the, the vision because I promised Sid Roth, right, that I would not do this until January, oh. which I'm going to do on the It's Supernatural program. And I know we got to go to a break, but the point is this, that when I jumped out of bed, it almost knocked me. I almost fell off the bed, right? And I jumped up And I went to start writing down a lot of the stuff that wound up in this book, The Wormwood Prophecy. Though I don't describe it as a vision in here, but like the narrative, Mm -hmm. when you're you're reading, I can't talk about it yet. But when you're reading about some of that stuff, that's because that's what I saw. But I don't want to say I had a vision. I wanted the book to just be about what I believe is going to happen, what I saw. But I will give this one thing away. As soon as I stood up out of bed and I went to write, it was like I don't think somebody whispered in my ear, but that's what it felt like. It felt like somebody whispered in my ear one word, apophis. Mm. And I only Uh knew this has something to do with an ancient demon god of destruction. And I also knew that there was an asteroid named apophis, Uh, but I didn't know anything about it. Um, In my research, ancient Egyptian deity, uh, agent of chaos, a a chaos monster, chaos Chaos dragon. dragon. Uh, equated with uh, deities in other pantheons. The Greeks called them Typhon. The, uh, the ancient Sumerians called it Tiamat in the Bible. We probably know it by the name Leviathan. Um, this was the word that you remembered after this disturbing dream vision earlier this year? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, uh, again, without really giving the details of what I saw, I will tell you this much, that in this night vision, almost more of a night terror, but I knew it was a thing from God. What I first thought I was looking at was a dragon. What I first thought I was looking at was a dragon undulating, right? Moving towards the earth. Mm -hmm. Uh, I later realized the way the sun was hitting something that was turning, that it was casting the shadow on it that made it look like it was moving Uh, back and forth like a snake or a serpent, right? But, but so it's interesting that you bring that up, you know, that, that and makes you wonder if some of these occult visions from the ancients were seeing some of the same kind of thing in terms of their description. And even why, and we'll, we'll have to talk about this like on the next program, but why does NASA do this? Why do they name these near-earth threatening 
space objects right. after these ancient deities, these ancient gods. Why there do they have a lot a of names right now that relate to Egyptian mythology? We uh, saw this with the uh, the asteroid called Bennu, mm -hmm. and then the probe to go visit it was called Osiris, Osiris Rex. Rex, which was a European Space Agency probe. But they really twisted around the acronym in order to make it fit: Osiris Rex, Osiris the King, mm -hmm. Osiris, who's the Lord of the Dead. And Bennu is where he's supposed to be buried. Yes, uh, Bennu was a representation of the uh, the bird, like a mm -hmm. phoenix, like the Bennu bird. bird. There was a resurrection bird, exactly. Right. So, yeah, you'd think that in our modern scientific age, our age of reason, that scientists like those working at NASA would uh, draw on, you know, wh why not name it for some of the great astronomers of, why not call it Comet Galileo or Copernicus or something like that? Why not, co you know, in, instead all of named digging after gods into and pagan goddesses. deities? Right. Well, and it could be, and I'm, I'm just reaching here, trying to, you know, uh, get into NASA's head about why you would name uh, a space rock Apophis. Uh, but one thing we know about Apophis from mythology was this god could not be stopped. It was all-powerful. Right. There was nothing you could do to stop whatever it wanted to happen. Is NASA, are they extending mm -hmm. something here? Mm -hmm. Well, what? yeah, Apophis um, was the chaos dragon that had to be fought every night. Mm-hmm. Um, now, back in the day, we those of us who know anything at all about Set, the evil twin brother of uh -huh. Osiris, is that back in the days of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, in that period of Egyptian history, Set was still one of the good guys. Mm -hmm. He rode the solar boat of Ra, the sun god, every night, and when it passed over the horizon, Set was on the front of the boat to fight off Apophis, because Apophis wanted to eat the sun and return the world to the primordial chaos from mm -hmm. which it emerged. It hated order and wanted to return the world to chaos, like Leviathan, Mot. like the god of death, Mot, like uh, Tiamat. The, uh, the, the, the Norse have a similar legend where Thor had to defeat a chaos dragon. The Hittites and Hurrians had a similar myth. The uh, early Indian culture had a simi mm -hmm. similar myth. Um, a warrior god had to defeat this god of chaos in order to allow for the creation of, of life, the creation of we everything on earth. We see in Genesis 1, 2, that the spirit is hovering over essentially a chaos The dragon. deep, to home, yes. which is the cognate uh, for, for the Sumerian Leviathan. Tiamat. Yes. Right. So, yeah, this, this is really curious that NASA would choose to give that particular name to an asteroid that has some chance of intersecting the orbit of the Earth. Right. And well, not I'm the orbit of the Earth, intersecting the Earth, and, which and, is yes, the whole exactly. point. And, 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 well, and in um, programs to come to follow this, I'm going to tell you why I believe it has more than some chance of impacting the Earth in 2029, so a little over nine years mm -hmm. from right now, and what that might mean in terms of uh, prophecy. Now, we don't want to scare people. That's not what we do. No. But at the same time, we believe in biblical prophecy, and we know these things are shortly to come to we pass. We talked about to Apophis script. last week and really didn't get too much into it, other than talking about what Apophis was to the ancient Egyptians and how it related to the religions of other ancient cultures, the chaos monster. NASA has applied that name to something that this way comes. What is Apophis, and why should we why should we care? Yeah, so here's the thing. Last week we talked about this fact that I had this night vision. Mm -hmm. uh, almost knocked me out of bed. But when it did, and again, we can't talk about what I saw because I promised Sid Roth I wouldn't until we do it on his show in January. It's awfully gracious of you. Yeah. I mean, preempting your own show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your own network. Right. Well, uh, in any case, though, but, but, but the first thing, I jumped up, I'm going to grab a pen, I'm going to write down, but something, it's probably just in my mind, I don't mean that there was a spirit in my room, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But something felt like it whispered in my ear, one word, Apophis. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't know what that was. I mean, I can say that I knew there was an ancient god of chaos named Apophis, didn't know a whole lot about it, knew far less about it than you and Sharon do, mm -hmm. uh, and I knew that there was an asteroid that the Neowise team, NASA, had named Apophis. But again, I didn't really know anything about it. So the first thing I did that day, uh, actually I went back to bed because I didn't want to wake Nita up. It was really early in the morning. But when I got up, I went in and turned on the uh, computer. And I went over into Google and I start, you know, trying to research everything I can find about the asteroid Apophis. Now, anybody could do this, but here's what I found. It was discovered in 2004. 
Now, originally, it really kind of was shaking some people inside the aerospace community because they concluded that this had a, a fairly significant chance of impacting the Earth in 2029. It's coming back around again some years after that. Uh, but uh, then they modified their conclusions. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. The diameter of this space rock is approximately 370 meters or 1,200 feet uh, across. It weighs an estimated 20 million metric tons. Hmm. It is traveling through space at 28,000 miles per hour. Uh, so if you think of something like that impacting the Earth, let's just say it's an understatement to say that that would be a mind-bending um, velocity mm -hmm. uh, impact, inertia impact uh, on this planet, whether it hit the ground or whether it hit the sea. Uh, now, there have been some studies that have been done in recent days, mapping studies, okay? If it impacts the Earth, where is it going to hit? One of the um, uh, mapping methodologies at NASA concludes that it's going to, if it hits the Earth, it's probably going to uh, hit around the coastlines of California and Mexico. So we're talking about super highly populated uh, areas. Uh, if it does hit Earth, they say the impact is going to unleash a blast, the equivalent of over uh, a billion tons of TNT, hmm. easily causing tens of millions, if not billions of deaths. Some calculations show billions of deaths, and that's partly because of something we're going to talk about in a little mm -hmm. while that we're just calling the Andromeda strain factor, uh, but also years of climate destruction. So uh, all of that. First, I want to say something that my investigation uncovered, uh, including NASA uh, and Apophis, and why I'm not alone in my conclusions, and this is in the book, all the data and all that around it, why I believe that there is a much greater chance that Apophis is going to impact Earth in 2029 and that it is being covered up. It is being obscured by NASA and the NEOWISE team. Now, it's really important for people to understand that I'm not alone in my conspiratorial thinking. For instance, in a recent peer-reviewed paper, Called an, and So you can look this up on Google and go to the link. An, ex, an empirical examination of wise neo-wise, near-Earth object, wide field, infrared survey, explore, asteroid analysis, <laughs> and results. <laughs> right? This is by Nathan uh, Mirvold. Yes. So Nathan, mm -hmm. you know, he, for a long time, he ran like the tech development side of Microsoft. And in fact, if you, if you Google him and read all the stuff about him, you find out that he's, he's called uh, Bill Gates' second brain, mm -hmm. right? all that kind of stuff. He is routinely listed in the top 100 critical scientific thinkers by numerous different peer-reviewed scientific journals. He's got 800 U.S. patents. I mean, what? so the guy's a brain, right? But in his, uh, uh, in his article, uh, he refutes the asteroid data from NASA, and these are his words. Now think about a guy that belongs to the astronomy community, uh, his work was actually published by an astronomy peer-reviewed magazine. So he's in that community. And this is what he says. And if you, if you imagine that words mean things, here's what he <laughs> says in his peer-reviewed article. He says, NASA is suffering from systematic errors and inconsistencies regarding potentially deadly near-Earth objects or NEOs. Uh, and then he goes on to say this. The very NASA managers who should have been supervising the project were more interested in protecting it from scrutiny. So we're talking now cover-up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, wait a minute. That's the heart of science, though, is that others can scrutinize your work. Right. He accuses them of a cover-up. And then he says this, the issues I am calling misconduct in the Neowise papers were not inadvertent. Uh, they appear to have been deliberate choices made repeatedly by the Neowise team over a long period of time. This is part of his article, or part of his paper, which have caused the astronomical community to work under the false belief that the Neowise results are more accurate than the evidence warrants. 
uh, and then he goes on to literally charge them with manipulation and, uh, and oversights. Yeah, I'm just glancing at the abstract here. I downloaded it while you were talking, so this is easily available on the yeah. internet if you want to do a search for this. And it, just in the abstract, he's, he's using words like uh, results are of poor quality, frequently mm -hmm. missing most or all of the data points on which they are based, uh, assumptions that are in many cases inconsistent with each other. You cannot base accurate results when you're when your assumptions are wrong and when the, the, the results you're getting Ex don't, don't fit the data points exactly. that you've observed. And in the world of science, you have to put your data down so right. that it can be reproduced and scrutinized. That's the whole point of peer review. So what is uh, Dr. Mirvold's uh, conclusion then? I mean, wh why would they be doing this? What, well, his conclusion is my conclusion, uh, and he's qualified to say it in ways I'm not because I'm not a scientist, I'm not an astronomer. I have to rely on brainiacs like Sharon Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to, to, to state some of this stuff. For me, again, it began with what I think was a divine revelation. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I would have never even known that this stuff was being disputed had that first not happened as a metaphysical experience, and I don't mean a new age mm -hmm. metaphysical mm -hmm. experience. But Merville's findings basically are this, that the largest database in the world, more than all other databases on this subject matter in the world combine, uh, concerning diameter, albedo, uh, other properties of asteroids, their their you know the way they mm -hmm. map their their trajectory, uh, approximately 164,000 asteroids is suffering from what he determined was intentionally manipulated information at worst, uh, and inadequate analysis at best. With the net result being that the public is being kept in the dark regarding something. Very, very important, which I believe is exactly what we are talking about here with the space rock Apophis. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm reading here that supposedly they used a different pi equation. Yeah. Well, that's now another scientist and a mathematician by the name of Harry Lear. And in fact, uh, right after uh, Donald Trump was elected president, he wrote a letter to Donald Trump strongly encouraging him to require the NASA scientists and the NEOWISE team to reevaluate the pi calculations around Apophis. And once again, uh, if he's correct, and his dispatch actually ends with, and I can't remember exactly the words, but basically he says, we're already out of time anyway, but just in case uh, something could be done about this, uh, he's begging them to cross-check the calculations because in his opinion, there's a very strong chance that the Earth will be impacted by Apophis in 2029. This, this, April 13th. April. Yeah, that's the other thing. Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th yes. of April. Yes. Wow. Wow. Yes. This is startling to me because most of us have been taught growing up that the value of pi is a constant: 3.14159, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this gentleman says, no, no, there's a different value to pi, and that's the one that should be applied to these calculations, which means that all of these calculations, which are already based on data that's been manipulated mm -hmm. by the... He also the, mentioned a, a different value to the golden mean in his uh, paper, so I'm not really sure where he's going This there, is way above my... math was wrong. Uh, is what it comes... This sounds like the beginning of a very disturbing movie like uh, you'd see on the Sci-Fi Channel or something. Well, do you remember, though, the, the problem that occurred a few years ago when instead of using metric calculations, they used the Royal the, Standard? The Mars, yes, and yeah. a, a, a couple of the Mars landers crashed yeah. because they, they, uh, they, they the teams the, in the U.S., yeah. what, what, the American team was on Imperial and the yeah, European Imperial. team was on metric. And so things like this happen. But sadly, when you're dealing with something that's, uh, what, uh, 20 million metric tons that's approaching the Earth at 28,000 miles per hour, it could have devastating consequences. If this talking if information's been manipulated by those inside NASA, perhaps intentionally or unintentionally through using the wrong calculations or whatever, if we're, we're basically, we really don't know what's coming at us, um, how does all of that then connect back together with the prophecy of the approaching falling star called Wormwood in Revelation chapter 8? Well, it, 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 it could be as simple as Apophis is biblical Wormwood and that people at NASA know about it. The, the book, by the way, The Wormwood Prophecy, is unusual in the sense that it is not fiction. It is a nonfiction work. Mm -hmm. But the very first chapter is a fictional narrative. And again, speaking, 
uh, as I did before the break, of a, a movie plot. The mm -hmm. opening chapter reads like the beginning of a movie, something that we might have seen. There were some movies back uh, within the last couple of decades mm -hmm. of... Uh, Deep Impact. Deep yeah. Impact, uh, Armageddon being mm -hmm. another. Mm -hmm. So think of the narrative in the film Deep Impact. Yes. Where, uh, you know, I, if I remember the plot line, I think there's a, maybe a kid yeah. that discovers, you know, that there is a space rock on a trajectory that could impact the Earth. And another scientist, I think, finds out about it, too. I forget exactly. And he dies maybe in a car wreck. Am I getting my films mixed Could up? Be. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. It's been so. a long time since I saw uh, it. And, uh, but the government finds out about it, and they're trying to cover it up. And they're trying to cover it up. Why? Because Mass they don't want panic. the world to panic. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Mass panic, looting, uh, the, what could require the imposition of martial law to keep law and order. People uh, getting in the way of constructing mm -hmm. those sanctuary cities to save the right. elites. Yeah. Right, 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 right. <laughs> uh, so, um, so that's you know the movie plot. But the, this book opens with a narrative like that that says they are aware, and you know between the ESA and NASA and whatever other space agencies, be quietly behind the scene, they are working to try to figure out is there a way to stop this asteroid, and they know that eventually it's going to become public knowledge. And then how, so all these other contingencies, how are we going to deal with it? You know, we're going to have to deploy the military on the streets of the United States and other places around the world. How are we going to deal with this circumstance? And then chapter two, though, opens with, okay, chapter one is fiction. Mm -hmm. Or is it? Or is it, yes. Right? And, uh, and if you thought that you could read chapter one and now sigh a breath of relief that it's only a narrative that isn't going to come to pass, the rest of this book is going to set in order how we believe that there is a cover-up at the highest order, including NASA, and we're not alone. There are experts, people that are mega intelligent, far more so than I am, right? And we're talking about qualified working scientists uh, who are challenging, and, are, and I think that number is going to continue to grow. I thought it was interesting that here, what, just um, like uh, three weeks ago now, Robert Frost, he's a NASA scientist. He's mm -hmm. a working scientist, mm -hmm. right? And he goes on television, and, he, and he's not saying apophis, but he is saying it is 100% certain that Earth is going to be destroyed by what might even be a planet-killing mm -hmm. stone. And, he's, and, and, and then later, people are asking about Apophis. And uh, uh, NASA puts out a statement in which they say, well, it could be that the only thing we're going to be able to do is pass out Bibles and tell people to pray. Why? Because the question was asked of Robert Frost, yes, but can't we stop these asteroids with nukes or something like that? And he, here's what he actually said uh, in a... Um, uh, I forget, it was like in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, one of the UK, uh, it was the Express. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. On the Express, he says, no known weapon system could stop the mass because of the velocity at which it travels an average of 12 miles per second. So, and then another scientist, also an NASA scientist, he said, we, we, we might have our ideas about how to stop something of this size all wrong anyway, because if it's that large, even if we successfully hit it with a series of nukes and maybe blew parts of it apart, the gravitational field around an object that big is so strong, it's just going to draw it back together again. Exactly. There might not really be an effective way for us to stop it anyway. And that's, is this like soft disclosure of one of L.A. Marzulli's like favorite <laughs> phrases, but around uh, uh, a space rock? Well, it seems that way, but you also had a NASA scientist visit you in Branson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so here's the thing. And by the way, his name, and you guys met him, and now we can't say his name at no, all. No, we can't. But his, his name was originally in the book and some of the stuff that he was telling me. Besides the, the, the other asteroid that has the song on it that I want to mm -hmm. talk about maybe mm -hmm. if we get time. Uh, but he had shared some stuff with me. I put it in the book. Then he winds up at our Branson conference, mm -hmm. and he says, I have got to talk to you. So we go in the back room. We're all private back there. And I found out that this guy had been drawn before an adjudicator. He was being threatened not only with his job, and this guy's a 30-year veteran in the aerospace community with huge contracts with NASA, right? He's, he's like one of the lead engineers on space flights and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So this is not the janitor right in the building. Uh, and he tells me, my name cannot be mentioned at all. I've just came from being drawn in front of adjudicator. Uh, I've, these are, they are threatening me with some serious stuff. And I had the feel he didn't say this, but I had the feeling that losing his job was only one of the things 
that might have been hinted oh. at, right? And so I had to take his name out of the book. The other thing that at some point if I get a chance to talk about, but you guys would probably already assume this, he tells me, he says, NASA, yeah, it's like our national space agency, but he said there's actually two space agencies. And if you want to know where the really big dollars are being siphoned off, it isn't into the published budget, operating budgets mm -hmm. at NASA. Well, well that, it wouldn't be. I mean, one of NASA's appointed jobs during the Obama administration was to spread the love of, of Islam. Yeah, yeah. But as, <laughs> again, that's, a, I'm sure, another cover story for what's actually oh, going yes, on behind the scenes. Oh, yes, it has to be. Now, there are other space agencies around the world. Um, there are 70, in fact, on the Earth, which I thought was really 70. intriguing. Yeah. 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 And 13 with launch capability. Oh, Isn't that curious? Oh, that's, yeah. that's so Yeah. But the European Space Agency apparently is, is you know, part of this. And, uh, and I imagine they would share information back and forth with NASA. Um, why would the, uh, the, the, the secret space agencies of the world, if you will, uh, again, is it really all about keeping the public from mass panic, or, or is there some other uh, aspect of this that, that needs to be explored? Well, and I will tell you that there's also, and I, I, you know, I can't prove any of this, but in the same way that we've learned recently that, that inside the Pentagon and other branches of our intelligence agencies and their studies of UFOs, where we've learned that there really was an interest in the paranormal as well. Are these demons? Are they angels? Is it God? And it, w uh, the further we move, the more we learn that that was actually a significant part of mm -hmm. the Pentagon's studies into what is UFOs. Well, it, it turns out that something about our asteroids also seems to have this whole metaphysical thing. And we're going to run out of time. When we come back, uh, I want to talk about, uh, what was it, Peace uh, 67? 67P, oh, yes, Comet yes. 67P. Yeah. I want to talk about Comet 67P yeah. and some other things that my friend uh, with his top secret security clearance at NASA uh, shared with me. Uh, and uh, so I think there, you know, there is something that's cosmological in the, in the supernatural sense about concerns that they have at NASA and elsewhere. In fact, in the narrative, in the opening chapter one, it includes people behind the scenes that also happen to believe in the Bible and they hmm. believe in prophecy. And they themselves see Wormwood as a trajectory that is going to hit Earth. But the question about, is it a space rock? Or is it something else? Yes, mm. yes. We've got to talk that's about that in the next program. That would be really interesting to know because I know that that's something that you included in your fictional book, uh, which I did the, the audio book for. By the way, if you write any more fiction, don't write so many characters with <laughs> gravelly voices. That's really hard to do. Uh, but the, uh, the Araman Gate uh, included people behind the scenes who had a biblical perspective on things. We, uh, we talked about that recently with the uh, Fourth Watch Films production, uh, entities. Higher Entities, right. uh, about the uh, Collins elite. Uh, do we think that perhaps there are those inside NASA or the ESA or other space agencies looking at this with a biblical perspective to try to figure out what's, what's going on? Yeah, I believe that. Yeah.